Manipulation through bluff. Man's strong sexual drive, his brilliant mind, and his need for a system that will help him bear those responsibilities recognized by his intelligence have enabled women to make effective use of certain institutions that properly belong to the past. Institutions like the Church, the many nonconformist sects, and the other religious communities. She cold-bloodedly uses them to help with the manipulation of her children. She exploits their armies of clergymen and other functionaries as a kind of military police force designed to protect women's interests even after her children are grown up. Hence, it is advantageous to women, as we have already noted, to be neither religious nor superstitious. Unless a boy's manipulation has been exceptionally successful, as in the case of those who decide to become priests, men are equally unlikely to believe in the dogma of their church. But if its teachings are inculcated at a very early age, they do help to provide certain archetypes, and a useful basis for the standards of good and evil. These are standards which have no rational roots, but are part of men's subconscious, and are therefore ineradicable. Essentially, these standards are always the standards of women. Any religious system must be based on manipulation since it consists of a series of rules and taboos, with a catalogue of penalties for trespass against those rules. These trespasses are called sins. The penalties for them are never imposed in reality, for faith in some kind of superconsciousness is a system without real foundation. No one could know about secret sins or exact punishment for them. As a result, people are apt to say that an unavoidable misfortune such as the loss of a friend or an earthquake is a punishment. In earlier times, when men's understanding of such disasters as plagues, crop failures, and lightning was limited, men believed they were punishments for sins committed at some previous time, and so they thought to avoid them in the future by unconditional surrender to rules or by repentance, a kind of brainwashing. Such myths become obvious as man's mind develops. He can prove fallacy by committing a sin without incurring any subsequent signs of wrath. But the deep-seated fear of punishment, the feeling of having sinned, carefully cultivated during a child's earliest years, will prevent him, as an adult, from doing something that was considered bad when he was a child. And, if by chance he does do something which as a child he called a sin, he will have, at the very least, a bad conscience. One sin which figured in almost all of these catalogues is pleasure in the sexual act when reproduction is not intended. Since men, provoked by women, always take pleasure in sex, they yield to this pleasure as often as possible and never once give a thought to reproduction. During orgasm, man experiences a certain kind of pleasure far from the joy of having just engendered a child. Thus, in this moment, man is even more than ordinarily deluded. They constantly transgress against the rules of their childhood beliefs, and thus always carry with them a feeling of sin. Women, on the other hand, having learned to control their sexual urge and to make love, for the most part, not for their own satisfaction, but for some specific purpose, breadwinning, reproduction, gratification of a man, in the latter case an act of charity, commit no sins thereby. Even if they consider sex sinful, they are immune to remorse. Unlike men who are constantly forming new resolutions which they never stick to, women do not have such a debit account in any system made for their use, even if they believed in such a system. With their tendency to self-abasement, their suppressed and stunted sexual needs, their assumption that they will survive without working by letting others work for them, they resemble those figures, Jesus Christ, Gandhi, who allow themselves to be considered ideals by men, Ideals which men, because of their slavery to their instincts, can never attain, and which confirm their suspicion that all qualities truly worthy of worship are, in the last analysis, feminine.
Yet in reality, neither women nor their chosen police force, the clergy, are really interested in man's sexual drive. The taboo did not have to apply to this particular instinct. They merely chose it because it is man's greatest and purest pleasure. Had he derived as much satisfaction from smoking or eating pork, woman would have equated smoking or eating pork with sin. The point is to keep him in a state of fear, thus open to manipulation. This is one of the reasons why the catalogue of sins varies according to a man's age. For a small child, the taboo is lying, coveting the property of others, and not honouring one's father and mother. For an adult, it is sexual desire and lusting after one's neighbour's wife. Yet how can they recognize these sins when they know neither the rules nor the system in whose name they were established? How can they believe in something that does not exist or feel ashamed of a pleasure that does not hurt anyone? Anything that deals with religious beliefs is contrary to the rules of reason and consequently has to be instilled at an age when a sense of logic is as yet undeveloped. If possible, this should take place in a building whose absurd design and architecture equal the absurdity of that which is preached in it, thus making it all a little less incredible. The purveyors of this type of illogical thinking should, if possible, look different from other people. If children are taught by men who dress like women, for example, or who adopt some other form of masquerade, their pupils' bewilderment and awe will be all the greater, and their respect for these figures will never entirely leave them. Women have taken great care to ensure that their lobby, the clergy, are always men. First, because the female image might be damaged if they represented their own interests, men might think them calculating. And second, because they know men rate feminine intelligence rather low, which is why they can only influence a man's emotions. Advice from another man, and one respected from childhood, is much more likely to be listened to and taken. Although this advice always benefits women, for example, they will advise a man to stay with a woman he doesn't love, or support children he never wanted, it does not reflect hostility on the part of this lobby toward normal men, but is a direct consequence of that lobby's financial dependence on women. Women could survive easily without the church. They only need it for the training of men and children, or as a setting for the display of specialized wardrobes. But the church would be ruined without the support of women. Children can be trained, and today are very often raised without the church's help. It is entirely possible that women one day might give up the nave of a church as the most effective background for a white dress. They might even consider a registrar sufficient to subdue a nervous bridegroom. Such trends would empty the churches in a couple of years. In the Soviet Union, marriage palaces have taken their place as a wedding background. If this became the fashion, people would see churches for what they really are, relics of a long-dead age. They would withdraw their financial support, both public and private, which in the last analysis has always been provided by men. It is man who pays his own tormentors. So when we hear someone say what magical power the church has, since it still draws people to it after many hundreds of years, the circumstance has obviously been misunderstood. It is not the church which possesses a magical power, it is women. All such institutions have long since become mere tools in the hands of women, and it is unlikely that they will ever do anything other than fulfill women's expectations. Ultimately, the victims are not the representatives of the various religious communities themselves. They want only to live a peaceful, undisturbed life, at the expense of masculine men, of course, just like women, and have become a kind of mafia used by women to terrify children, enslave men, and put a break on progress. These men are forced, under the threat of boycott, to appear in ludicrously effeminate clothes, 
to intone grotesque songs loudly and to tell horror stories to a sometimes even intelligent audience. All this despite the fact that these stories, by which they make such abject fools of themselves, have long been discarded by modern theology and stand in obvious contrast to all they have been taught as students at their universities. Women need those moth-eaten tales of heaven and hell, of devils and angels, of paradise and judgment day. Death is only a useful means of manipulation if it is a door leading either to eternal happiness or to eternal damnation. To which of these two realms this door may lead is dependent on a kind of point system scored according to earthly achievement and calculated by women. If life everlasting can be won only by faithfulness and slavery, it falls in with the interests of women, interests which would in no way be furthered if men decided to investigate eternal life in biological terms, an investigation for which we might have to wait a couple of generations. Women themselves are, of course, quite unmoved by all these myths. They go to church only if and when they want. Their consciences do not bother them either way. For the big ceremonies, which are really attempts at intimidation on the part of women, not on that of clergymen, they array themselves in suitable attire, wedding dresses, christening clothes, mourning clothes, confirmation dresses, their men in the usual dark suits. They enact the roles of believer, superstition, or skeptic, but in reality their minds are elsewhere. They are not interested in male speculations on the possibility of walking on water, turning water into wine by magic, or by achieving, also with the help of magic, an immaculate conception. As usual, their interest does not concern itself with the essence of the thing as such, but with its possibilities of exploitation. If a man of another faith wants to marry a woman and demands her conversion in exchange for his own promise to work for her, no woman would hesitate for a moment.